Father, we thank you, Lord, for every privilege, every time we have that we might stand and speak concerning some of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord God. I pray that all glory, all honor that be given to you and you alone be given to your son. I pray that the hearers of your word would be blessed, edified, but most of all, your name will be glorified and exalted above all other names. We ask it in the strong name of him who is, who was, and who is to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all persons who are involved in this telecast, be it now, be it days, weeks, yea, even years to come, because thy word is eternal and thy word is settled in heaven forever. We ask it in the name of Jesus, and we pray, amen. On today, I want to read a portion of scripture found in the Gospel of St. Luke, the third chapter, beginning at verse 10. St. Luke, third chapter, beginning at verse 10. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said unto them, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans, to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be contented with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, and John answered, saying unto them all, I need baptize you with water, but one mightier than I coming, 
the latches of whose shoes are not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Thus ends the reading of God's word. I want to, as the Lord will guide, talk about signs and symbols pointing to a savior. Signs and symbols pointing to a savior. John the Baptist, named by the angel Gabriel, like as his cousin, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. John is born into a priestly family. He was strong, he was strange, and he was set apart for extraordinary duty. And a mighty biblical character was he. He comes on the scene during the era of some of the most notorious appointed rulers of the Roman Empire. But John also, in the fullness of time, uh, God so fit to ordain the word to be made flesh at the same time. John's ministry begins when in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, and uh, uh, he was on the throne, Pontius Pilate was appointed governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch was of Galilee. Herod's brother Philip was the tetrarch of Idurea and of Triconiatus, and Licinius the tetrarch, or the governor, if you please, of the regions of Abilene. These geographical areas were assigned to them to rule the long since now conquered nation of Israel. And Caiaphas and Ananiah were the two high priests serving in Moses' seat with no godly power or godly spirit of righteousness in them at all. The chosen people of God has been uh, subjugated and they are now powerless and under uh, many nations who had ruled them and defeated them. Now these nations were conquering one another with Israel in the middle, while being shifted and sifted back and forth until the Roman war machine has finally come and put down all rule except the Romans' rule. And being under the conquest of these power, they are the very nations that King David had defeated in antiquity when God ruled uh, them years before Israel had left him for other gods. But God, who cannot lie, and with him all things are possible. God always keeps his promises. He raised up a prophet called John the Baptist in the very midst of these godless and ruthless Roman rulers. The Lord did say, where sin abound, where sin runs rampant, and grace does much more abound, though, in Romans 5.20. John the Baptist, the only son of Zachariah, Zachariah rather, and Elizabeth of the tribe of the Korahites. He was born to them when they were well past the flowering age of childbearing. That ought to give some mothers hope. John, born to a priest, but called to the prophetic ministry by divine appointment. Six months older than Jesus, according to the flesh. But he stayed in the desert until the Lord brought him forth to reveal to him, to Israel. He grew up and became strong in spirit. He came preaching the baptism of repentance and preaching in the power and the likeness of his predecessor, Elijah. He grew up and was appointed an anointed prophet of the highest, which was Luke 176 says so, for he shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, to give light to them that sat in darkness and them that sat in the shadows of death, 
to perform uh, the mercies uh, that God had promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to guide our feet into the way of peace. John's clothes were not very fashionable at all, maybe like mine. He was dressed in skins of animal hair, you know, like we, like we do, like the dress sometimes, you know, put on furs, minks, uh, chinchilla stoles, rabbit and raccoons hat. He didn't eat uh, meat either, but his diet was local, grasshopper, bugs, and honey from the honeycomb, you know, like we like to eat. Crawfish, calamari, squid, mussels, mm -hmm, shellfish, and, and <coughs> well, that's what we like to eat too. So maybe he wasn't too different from us after all. He was fearless. He was energetic. He was a very vocal preacher. He was a powerful vocamer. He was an evangelist and an announcer. A voice crying in the wilderness around about the Judean countryside and baptizing all who came to him. His preaching offended all, or rather affected all walks of life. He preached to the illiterate and the educated. Uh, he preached for them to repent. He proclaimed to the rich and the poor, his powerful proclaiming to the kings and queens, even to the Congress. He warned the governors and the mayors, the judges, the tax collectors, the soldiers, even the sinners and the jailers. He warned them. Uh, all of them were under the wrath and the judgment of God. Uh, his message touched the powerful, the prestigious, and those of the prominence. His mission and his ministry uh, were to turn the hearts of the people toward the one who was coming after him, and the one who is, and the one who was, and the one who will come again. He warned them to repent and to turn unto God, he was born with the Holy Spirit in him. He is the only person born of a woman that can make that unique acclaim. The word of God found him out there in the wilderness, in the countryside. The word of God always finds his servant in strange, remote, unusual, off-beaten path and places of most likely unfamiliar and peculiar setting. The word of God came to Abraham when we, he was with his family in the Ur of the Chaldees worshiping idol. I said Abraham and his family were in the Ur of the Chaldees worshiping idols. The word came to Moses on the backside of Mount Horeb in the desert tending his father's sheep. The word came to Ezekiel by the river of Sheba while he was down there in captivity. The word came to Isaiah at the funeral of King Uzziah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the majestic splendor and the beauty of his glory. The word of God came to two women who were well up in their age, Sarah and Elizabeth, to announce birth of a child to them. The word of God also came to a virgin and told her she was going to be pregnant without having a man to, uh, to do anything with her. The word came unto the shepherds while they were feeding their flocks at night. Glory to God in the highest peace on earth and goodwill to men. The word of God came to Saul on a dusty Damascus road on his way to do some dirty deeds for the devil. And the word came to John the Baptist who was in the wilderness. The word came to be baptized in the flesh at the Jordan. The word came unto John while uh, baptizing in the Jordan. Behold, the Lamb of God saw, saw him which taketh away the sin of the world. And John's preaching was different from those of the status quo. Their, their nation was already oppressed, stressed, and a rule by a foreign power. Now here comes John, preaching about another king and another kingdom, about another government, another power who was coming, another kingdom, and claiming to be king of kings and lord of lords. 
He was coming to set up an earthly kingdom different from all the other earthly powers and potentates who rule by the sword. His kingdom will come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This other king and kingdom will rule by love, grace, and mercy. His preaching was good news to those who were are the least and the last and the left out. But his preaching offended those who were satisfied in their sins and in their situation. And John's preaching, like his predecessor Elijah before him, was troublesome to the kingdoms on earth whose power were politically correct but immorally incorrect. You might have been given authority to rule, but how you rule makes sure it's not immoral but moral. John's preaching disturbed the religious institutions as well as the social mainstream, the military, the scientific world, the economical system, who by reason of deliberate design, these entities of Judaism had left the principles of the biblical instruction of the Mosaic and the Abrahamic covenant. The Almighty had given them to observe that they had left it. And they were now embracing those ideologies and contrary to the teaching and the doctrine of God's word. Then when God shows up and when the representative of God's kingdom appears and announce his rightful authority to rule in the affairs of men, these worldly potentates, they are traumatized. They, they, are, they are terrified. They are tormented. They are threatened and are in a state of turmoil when challenged by the kingdom of the Almighty whose appointments are, are eternal, not temporary. I said the appointments of the Almighty are not temporary, they are eternal. The kingdom of God is eternal, therefore the things associated with God are assigned to eternal existence. That's why Romans 11:29. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He is not like man. He does not take back anything that he has given us. Ephesians 4.30 said we are sealed until the day of redemption. No one, nobody, absolutely no one, no saint, no child of God for any reason who enters into the kingdom of God should be threatened by any power that be. Jesus said it is not possible, positively not possible, no power on earth can change the power of God. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, Romans 8.31, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of godly let? It is God who justifies. Who is he that is at the right hand of God and maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution or famine, or being naked or hungry, physical danger, coronavirus? Oh no, in all these things we are more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death no hell, no angel, no principality, no power, no things present or things the past shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. When John came preaching the baptism of repentance, he knew that this baptism was not enough to save us from these dreaded conditions coming upon the world. He came as a forerunner, an announcer, and calling to those who were chosen before the foundation of the world that they should repent and cry out for mercy and ask the question, what must I do to be saved? He came to prepare a way for the way. He knew that water baptism was like unto fleshly circumcision. Moses' fleshly circumcision was to identify or uh, the, the listeners and those who were circumcised with Jehovah and having the seal and the sign of Abraham who circumcised his entire household, hmm, identifying them 
with the covenant the Lord made with Abraham. But the promises were not to everybody in the house. Hear me. Because Ishmael was born according to the flesh. And he was not of the born woman, or rather he was of the born woman of Hagar, not of the promise of the seed of Isaac. In other words, circumcision of the heart is required for justification before God. So it is. With baptism in the spirit of God, it must be performed in the heart and not the hand. The power of the Holy Spirit has to do the work for salvation. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So says John 4.24. Those who heard John's preaching came unto him from all over the world, all over, all over that region, looking to, for, to receive the remission of sin, forgiveness, and washing away of their sin. They heard John's messages, received his ministry, joined his ministry, and became John's followers. Please do not miss this. Please do not miss this. Those who were following John believed him, were baptized by him, served in his ministry, and really felt sorry for their sins. They repented of their sins. That is, uh, that is to say, they changed their ways of living, began a new life, and began going to church on the water baptism that they had received. John's baptism of repentance and remission of sin was based on one's conscience, not on the heart. Being sorry for transgression and repenting does not remove the penalty for sin. Breaking the law of God and feeling sorry for what the violation you have made does not change the consequences or excuse the lawbreaker from the penalty. God's justice must be satisfied. The wages of sin is always death. They heard John and believed John and were baptized by John, set in John's pulpit. John, John's missionary ministry, members of the church of John, went to the worship every Sabbath day in St. John's church, if you please. They had repented of their ways and transgression, changed their ways, and began a new life. But there was a problem. John's preaching and his baptism had power for people to repent, but had no power for them to be saved. My Lord. John's baptism was visible, it was temporary, and it was water. It was used as a sign for cleansing, not for salvation. I indeed, John said, baptize you in water. It's a ceremonial sign. It's your identification with the local visible kingdom of God on earth. There are so many who want to be like Jesus, but don't want to do like Jesus. There are those who want to look like Jesus, but don't want to live like Jesus. There are those who want power like Jesus, but don't want the poverty that Jesus had. There are so many who want to serve like Jesus, but don't want to sacrifice like Jesus. There are those who want to identify with Jesus, but don't want to die to self like Jesus. John's preaching was to prick the hearts and the conscience uh, of those minds, and they were needing a lasting, permanent change in their lives. What water baptism could not do, the Holy Spirit did. It burns in your heart of men and women and boys and girls, purging, cleansing, washing, transplanting a new heart into them from above. The Holy Spirit's baptism placed you into the body of Christ, guaranteeing that you will have eternal life. John's baptism was a promise made, or rather, John's baptism was a promise made. Jesus' baptism was a promise in the Spirit which was fulfilled. John's baptism was in water. Jesus' baptism was in the Holy Ghost and fire. John's baptism is to repentance. Jesus' baptism is unto salvation. John's baptism is a sign. Jesus' baptism is a seal of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism is what you do. Jesus' baptism is what he did for you on the cross and at the Pentecost. 
John baptism was the beginning of the work to believe. Jesus' baptism was finishing the work on the cross. John's baptism was outside of the Jordan River. Jesus' baptism is on the inside in the heart. The baptism of John places you in the local assembly to learn, to study, to fellowship, to wait on your calling. Understand what Jesus says. Go learn what this means. The faith of God, the faith from God, and the faith in God, and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ come from hearing the word of God. The devil believed, but he can't receive. Simon the sorcerer believed, but he wanted the Holy Spirit to make money for him in Acts 14. King Saul believed, but he never was converted. The false prophet Balaam preached, but he never, never understood what he was preaching. John said he was a voice of one crying in the villainous. His message was get yourself prepared to receive a new heart. John's preaching was preparation for the operation of a new heart to be transplanted and God would open your heart like he opened Lydia's heart in Acts 16. John told his listening audience, don't rely on your ancestors' relationship with God. You must be, uh, uh, know him for yourself. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. John, John, you must know him for yourself, brother. God can raise up stones and rocks to praise him, says John. Do good works and give evidence of your repentance. Learn to share a ride. Give kind words to those who are kind to you. Stop stealing from God and stealing from the people. Don't abuse your place of responsibility that has been entrusted to you. Responsibilities and powers are privileges. They are not right. Be contented and thankful as to what God has given you. Be grateful always. All those who heard him, all those who listened to him, all those who paid attention to him, they began to muse. They began to surmise, deduce, and think, conclude by the way of human reasoning that John must be uh, the promised Messiah. But true prophets of God, they handled their honor with humility. By his own admission, John says he was unworthy and compares to him who is the express image of the only begotten of the Father. John declared that Jesus is before me he was in the beginning with God. He is uh, in the beginning before the beginning began. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And after the order of Melchizedek, he is the root that came out of dry ground. He is the faithful and just, the only true God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose his sandals, John said. His name is Jesus, Rose of Sharon. Abraham's promise, Isaiah's seed, Moses' bush burning, Jacob's ladder to heaven, Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of a wheel. Jesus is Jehovah's Savior. What can wash away my blood? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, or rather, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How can I be born again? Believe that he is who he said he is. The cross is a sign. A buildings are a sign. Water baptism is a symbol and a sign pointing to him according to scripture. He suffered, he bled, and he was crucified. Yes, he was buried in the grave. Some argued that he didn't stay in there three days. But the Bible said according to the scripture, he stayed there three days. And my rock got up out of the rock of ground. He rose from the dead. All power is in his hand. Anybody believe in him? Have the Jesus Christ, not the sign. You have the Savior. You want the Savior. You don't want the symbol. You want the Savior. And in him, you have life forevermore in him. There's goodness and mercy in him. There's joy unspeakable in him. There's power in him. There is all that you need. Jesus, the Christ. Not a sign and not a symbol, but the person of the Messiah himself. God in flesh with man. Hallelujah. Amen. You make my day. You came my way. You heard me every time I pray. Peace, you gave me 
grace. Jesus is the answer. He breaks every fetter. He breaks every fetter. It really doesn't matter. There is nothing impossible, nothing infallible, nothing too hard for my God to work. This is the answer. Jesus is the answer. He breaks every fetter. He breaks every fetter. It really doesn't matter. There is nothing impossible, nothing infallible. You brought the sunshine in my life. You are the lifeline. You brought the sunshine. You brought the sunshine in my life. You are the lifeline. You brought the sunshine. You brought the sunshine. While God is the sunshine, we want to thank our mothers for being the sunshine as well. Keep in mind, Jesus is the sunshine. Mm -hmm. 